My name is Shirley Ann Ward, and the cancer I'm going to talk about is the most fatal of all women's cancers. I want to talk about how I went from despair back to promise. The dreaded words are uttered. You have what turned out to be a very aggressive and a very fast growing ovarian cancer. It's okay, I said to the doctor. God told me this was coming and he will bring me through. I have my five-year checkup and the doctor calls it graduation day. After five years, I am no longer a part of his care. I am discharged and he tells me that this kind of cancer rarely ever comes back, so go out and enjoy life. Let's bring us to October 2013. And once more, the dreaded words are uttered. You have ovarian cancer. This time there's no reassuring words that God would bring me through. I couldn't understand how he could have allowed this cancer to come back. I had believed that when he said he would heal me, it was for always. And now it was back. And he could have stopped it, but he didn't. And I didn't understand why. It wasn't long before that disappointment turned to anger and anger mostly against Father God, because I still don't understand why. For as long as I remember, there was always a song going through my head, and now it was gone. The only thing I could think of at that point was to read my Bible. So I downloaded several versions onto my iPad and I started reading a chapter a day, hoping that something would jump out at me. And nothing did. Let's fast forward. And I asked my doctor, I said, if I am asked the question, do I have cancer? How do I answer honestly? And he said, I don't have cancer. I had cancer, but it is in remission. Now, you can call me slow at processing things, but it wasn't until the next night that the light turned on. I had heard the words and they got into my head but that was all they had done. And suddenly, it hit me. God had used the doctor to tell me that I had hope for a future, that my cancer was gone, and now it had moved from my head to my heart. So I want to speak to some of you out there who might be facing the similar kind of situation. It may not be cancer. It may be healing of another kind. It might be a difficult situation in your family. Or maybe there's somebody you know who's facing difficult situations and don't know how to deal with it. And they're not really sure about God at this point. They're not sure whether he actually listens to them or does keep his promise. But I want to tell you, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His promises never fail. And my song is back. Amen. Amen. Amen.
And we stand to our feet. God is faithful, amen? I just really feel like in this moment that as a family, we just need to thank God for his faithfulness and remind ourselves that God's promises never fail. Even in the darkest moments, even when we're in the valley and even when we're on the mountaintop, God's promises, they never fail. I'm wondering if we can just close our eyes right now in this moment and just lift our hands towards heaven in a sign of surrender to our God, to our great, merciful, good God. And in your own words, even in this moment, just begin to thank God for who He is. That He is good. That His grace and His mercy are more than enough more than enough.
Amen. Well, that was a great time of worship together. Wasn't that a powerful testimony from Shirley Ann? Uh, would you just give praise to God again one more time about that? Again, we're always just wanting to, to announce what God is doing. And I just felt like as, as the t- testimony was being played, as we're singing, I just felt before I get into the, the sermon that God has put on my heart for us this morning, I just felt like the Lord wanted me to read a few verses from Psalm 18, uh, just to encourage you in keeping with what he's been already speaking to our hearts about today. The psalmist writes this, I love you, Lord. You are my strength. You know, we try to find strength so many other ways. Jesus is your strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my savior, my God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. I called on the Lord who is worthy of praise and he saved me from my enemies. The ropes of death entangled me. The floods of destruction swept over me. The grave wrapped its ropes around me. Death laid a trap in my path, but in my distress, I cried out to the Lord. Yes, I prayed to my God for help. He heard me from his sanctuary, and my cry to him reached his ears. How many are thankful that when you call on God, he hears and he knows? Amen? And so I just felt like I needed to encourage you, whatever it is you're facing, whatever you're going through, whatever you're looking at, God knows, and he hears the cries of your heart. Call unto him, and he will be your rock and your refuge and your strength. Let me just pray one more time. Lord Jesus, I thank you for who you are. And as we turn to your word, God, I pray that you will... Take this message and make it so much more than I ever could. Lord, I, I, I give you this time and these words like the little boy who managed to round up some loaves and fishes and gave it to you. Lord, I pray that you are blessed by it, but that you take it and multiply it. And you use it for your glory, for your purpose to feed and sustain and minister to more than we ever could on our own. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to say welcome to all of those worshiping with us online and all of you who are here with us today. And I want to start by asking you a question. Have you ever met anybody famous? Have you met anyone famous? Maybe a famous musician or a famous artist or actor or famous athlete. And when you met them, how did you react or how did you feel? Uh, I've met a few famous people in my life. I've met Don Cherry. Good old grapes. I was actually at a golf tournament and he was kind of the celebrity uh, guest there and uh, had a bit of an interaction with him. He was pretty cool and everything like that, eh? It's my best Don Cherry impression. I know, stick to preaching, right? Yeah, I got it. Uh, I met Bobby Orr a few times. Actually, um, I was born in Perry Sound, and when we lived in Perry Sound, we lived across the street from Bobby Orr's parents, and so whenever Bobby would come to visit his parents, we'd go over and we'd spend some time with him. I've actually got a picture of me when I was just about two years old sitting on Bobby's knee uh, with all the trophies behind him in his parents' house, but I was so young, I don't remember it, you know? And uh, I've had minor interactions with him since then, but, but nothing that I really remember. I walked past Joffrey Lupul this past year. How many know Joffrey Lupul? Any Leaf fans out there, Toronto Maple Leaf fans? Joffrey Lupul, well, we got one diehard in the crowd. <laughs> you and me, you and me, we're fans. Um, I was at Sick Kids in, in Toronto, and uh, he walked past me, and by the time I realized who it was, I, I was like, that's Joffrey Lupul. And I turned around and the elevator doors were closing. And at that moment, I contemplated like running up the stairs to try to, you know, and figure out what I could get him to sign, you know, that kind of thing. Because people, when, they're, when they when we meet somebody famous, we do things we wouldn't normally do, right? It's called being starstruck. 
And when you're starstruck, you do something that you wouldn't normally do. You act in a way that you wouldn't normally act. I heard someone tell about their friend who was in a hotel in the United States, and they were in the, uh, in the washroom, and when they came out of the stall, as soon as they walked out of the stall, they couldn't believe it, but standing right in front of them, they almost ran into them, was none other than the godfather of soul himself, James Brown. And he couldn't believe it. He was so starstruck, he didn't even really know what to do. So in that moment, he stuck out his unwashed germy hand <laughs> to greet James Brown and said to him, it's really nice to meet you, huh? Kind of like James Brown would, and James Brown did not take kindly to that and did not shake his hand, and, and it was a weird interaction because when, when you are starstruck, you do something you wouldn't normally do. You don't normally shake hands in the washroom, and if you do, I suggest you stop. When you do things, you, you, when, you're, when you're starstruck, you, you do things. And we've all had one of those moments where, you, where you're nervous meeting someone. I mean, starstruck people, their, their hands get sweaty, their heart gets racing, their minds race to get that goofy kind of grin on their face. And we've all seen videos of, you know, people screaming and cheering a name together and, and hugging the random stranger beside them and singing and laughing. And that's just men with courtside seats at a Raptors game, you know? That's not even like women at a Taylor Swift concert, you times that by 20. As people, when they're starstruck, they do things they wouldn't normally do. Why? Well, there's this excitement and anticipation. There's this excitement and anticipation about who you get to meet and who you're meeting, and you, you get to have some relationship with them that, that maybe you're going to get some attention from somebody that you really, really admire or or that you can't believe that you're actually going to have some level of relationship with somebody that you didn't think you could actually meet ever or have relationship with, that they're going to pay some attention to you. And friends, I want to suggest to you that there's truly only one person, one star that we should ever be starstruck about, and that's Jesus. And when you think about who he really is, when you think about the magnitude of Jesus. Think about his power, his influence, his love, his grace. You think about what he's done. Think about all the people that he's influenced. There, there should be this excitement and this anticipation that we actually get to meet him. We actually get to talk with him. We actually have relationship with him. There's this, there's this anticipation. There's this excitement that should grip us if we're starstruck with Jesus. If we are starstruck with Jesus, we will do things that we wouldn't normally do. And that's what we're going to talk about as we start this Christmas series called Starstruck for the next four weeks. We're going to talk about what it means to really truly follow the bright and morning star, Jesus Christ himself. Would you turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew? The Gospel of Matthew, we're going to start right at the beginning and the reason why we're going to start and uh, look at this series through Matthew, the Christmas story um, is written both in Matthew and Luke. We're going to focus primarily on Matthew because Matthew's gospel is the one who has the story about the star in it and the story about the, the wise men following the star. And if you want to label anybody starstruck in the Christmas story, arguably it has to be the wise men. And so we're going to spend most of our time through this series in the Gospel of Matthew. We'll, we'll look at some verses in the Gospel of Luke as well, but we're going to focus on Matthew. And, and really the story of the wise men starts in chapter 2, and we're going to get there in a minute. But I want to start right at the beginning of Matthew. And, and the reason I want to start there is because we need to understand why Matthew wrote his book the way he wrote it before we can really understand why he has the story of the wise men and the star in there in the first place. Okay, so Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. This is a record of the ancestors of Jesus, the Messiah, a descendant of David and of Abraham. What Matthew does is he starts with this verse and then he has a list, a genealogy, a list of all the names 
that led to Jesus being born. Now, why would Matthew start with a boring old genealogy? I mean, it's like Matthew missed the class at school how to write a gripping introduction, right? He writes this boring old genealogy. Why in the world would he do that? I mean, most people, when they go to read the Christmas story in Matthew, they skip the first 17 verses and start right at verse 18. But let me assure you, this is no boring old genealogy. And this first sentence, this first statement of Matthew, he's not wasting time before he tells the most incredible story ever told, the birth of Jesus. He's setting it up. Let's look at it again. He says, this is a record of the ancestors of Jesus That word means savior. That's what Jesus means. Right from the very beginning, he's saying to all his readers, this story that I'm about to tell you is about the savior, the one who saves people from his sins. He is divine. And then he says, Jesus, the Messiah. Messiah means Christ. Jesus Christ. Christ is not his last name. Christ means promised one, anointed one. Matthew's writing to a primarily Jewish audience here. And he's saying to those Jewish people, all the prophecies, all the testimony, all the scriptures you heard all in the Old Testament point to this person I'm about to tell you about. Everything you've heard, this is the one you're anticipating. This is the one you're getting exciting, excited to meet. This is him. It's Jesus. And then, as speaking to any Jewish audience, the first question they're going to ask If you claim to know the Messiah and who the Messiah is, they're going to say, okay, well, is he in the line of King David? Because all the prophecies that said he would come in the line of King David. And so he says, he's a descendant of David. And then he goes even back further in the Old Testament to Abraham, the father of Israel himself. This is who I'm talking about. This is Jesus. And then he goes on and he lists all the names of people in the genealogy that prove that Jesus is in the line of King David. Now, something very important to understand here is that Matthew is not just listing the technical specifications that mean Jesus was in the line of David, but in the listing of the names here, he's actually showing us the character and the essence of who Jesus is. And what Matthew wants all of us to understand all the way through his book and right from the very beginning is this. Jesus is the sovereign over the wise and he's the shepherd of the weak. Jesus is the sovereign over the wise and he is the shepherd of the weak. See, the leaders and the rulers and the people that ancient people used to worship were the cunning and the swift and the powerful and those who had recognition, those who we would say had star power those who were influential, and they could use their influence to do what they want. They would even use their influence to make history say what they wanted it to say. And these powerful leaders and rulers, they would hire scribes to write their history for them. And when they wrote their history, they would elevate the good things about them, they would elevate the great issues and aspects of them, and they would leave out some of the negative things about their rulership and their leadership. That's what it meant to have star power. You could make yourself look better. What Matthew wants us to understand is true star power comes from Jesus. Jesus, who is a sovereign over the wise. Every ruler, every leader, every authority, everyone. Jesus is sovereign over them all. And yet, he chose to become the shepherd of the weak. He chose to come and be identified with the unimportant and the insignificant and the inconsequential. In fact, he even did something more powerful than that. I'd have to be stronger and say he came to be identified with the unholy and the the depraved and the downright sinful. In fact, when you look through the list of names that Matthew includes at the beginning of his book here, it's not like any other leader did when they wrote their history. I mean, this list of names does not look like the line of the royal family. It looks more like the real housewives of Israel. I mean, there is, there is like adulterers and murderers and 
cheaters and backstabbers and liars and people who love to fight and prostitutes and teenage mother. I mean, there's just, this list of names is unbelievable when you really look at it. And there are some names of good people in there too, but, but Matthew doesn't exclude the, the stuff that people want to forget. In fact, it seems like he highlights it. And you really notice this with four names in particular. Four names that didn't belong in genealogies. The reason is they were women. And women didn't go in genealogies because it always came through the line of the male. And yet, Matthew lists the name of four women, and it's not just any women. The first one was Tamar. Tamar. You can read about Tamar's story in Genesis chapter 38. You know what Tamar did? Tamar pretended to be a prostitute so that she would get pregnant by Judah. This is not the kind of thing you want to highlight. And not only that, then he goes on and he lists Rahab. Now, Rahab did not pretend to be a prostitute. She was a prostitute. And Rahab's story is she protected some spies from Israel as they went into Jericho. She protected them, and so later when Israel attacked then she was spared and she was brought in to be part of Israel, which got, has her connected to Boaz. And then you've got Ruth. He lists Ruth here. Now, Ruth, thankfully, Ruth had nothing to do with prostitution. So at least we got that going for us as we get going through the list of women. And everything you've heard of Ruth has probably been great. It's a good story. Ruth, it's a great story. I encourage you to read it. A story of love and loyalty and commitment. It's a great story, the story of Ruth. The problem is, Ruth is not Jewish. Ruth is from Moab. She's a Moabite. Matthew, what are you doing? Why are you highlighting the fact that she's from Moab? Why are you putting that in here in this genealogy to Jewish readers? I mean, what, what is that all about, Matthew? And just in case we're not picking up what he's putting down here, because every time one of these names would have been read or stated, everybody would have thought about their story, they would have thought about the sin, they would have thought about the issues, right? And just in case we're not smelling what he's cooking here, he gets really specific with it with the next person. Because he doesn't list her name, he just lists the sin. Matthew writes, Jesus, the father of King David, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Your modern day translations actually put her name in there for us to make it easy for us to know who it is, Bathsheba. But in the original, Matthew didn't even write her name. He just wrote the sin. The one who used to be Uriah's wife this indiscretion of King David, this one that King David had an affair with, and then he killed her husband Uriah to try to cover it up. Matthew, what are you doing? Why are you listing this? Why are you highlighting this? These are the things that the people of Israel want to forget. They want to think about King David, this righteous ruler and leader, and this one who did all the great things for Israel. This is King David we're talking about here. You've got to hide the indiscretion. No, no, no. No. Matthew wants everybody to understand right from the very beginning, not only the technical specifications that Jesus is in the line of David, but the essence of who Jesus really is. He's the sovereign of the wise, and he is the shepherd of the weak. See, Matthew is not writing this as the story goes. We have to remember, Matthew is writing this as he looks back. He's writing this after Jesus has already grown up. He's writing this after Jesus has called Matthew, who was a tax collector, a liar, a sinner, a cheat himself. He's writing this after he has spent three years with Jesus, watching him teach and tell people about God and and ministering to people and love people. He's writing this after he watched Jesus Christ die on the cross and be raised again. Matthew's writing this story after Jesus came to him and said, hey, Matthew, disciples, go and tell the story. 
Go and tell the real story. Go and tell the whole story. Let everybody understand who I really am, that I am God, I am divine, I am the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and yet I'm the shepherd of the weak. I'm the center of history. See, Matthew is coming to say Jesus is the center star of history. Jesus is the center of everything. Everything in history points up to Jesus. Everything in history since then points back to Jesus. He is the center of history. You are not the center of history. I am not the center of history. Our generation is not the center of history. Billions of people have come. Billions of people have gone. Empires have come. Empires have gone. Kings, rulers, dictators, authorities, presidents, prime ministers have all come and gone. And one man remains and his name is Jesus Christ. He is the center of it all. Matthew wants everybody to understand Jesus is the sovereign over the wise. Every ruler, every leader, every authority, everyone. He's king of it all. And yet, he's a shepherd of the weak. He didn't use his power to just elevate himself and make himself look good. He used his power to help and influence other people. That's why Matthew, when he starts to tell the story of how Jesus was born, shows that Jesus is fully God, sovereign over the wise. He starts in verse 18 by this. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Divine, pure, perfect, holy and fully God is Jesus. And then he also shows that Jesus is fully human. He's a shepherd of the weak. Look, a virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means, would you say it with me? God is with us. Would you say that again? God is with us. Now think about for your own life what that really, really means. And then say it with me again. God is with us. He's a shepherd of the weak. He came to take on human flesh, to identify with us, to understand who we are. He became the shepherd of the weak. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded. He took Mary as his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus, the Savior, the one who would save us from our sins. See, this is the context. This is how we understand why Matthew put the story of the wise men in his book. And We see the beginning of the story of the wise men starts this way. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. At about that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. Friends, the the wise men were starstruck with Jesus. And when you are starstruck, you go to great lengths to draw close. When you're starstruck, you go to great lengths to draw close. Matthew says that they came from eastern lands. We don't know exactly what that means. We don't know exactly the place that they came from. It could be Arabia or Persia or Mesopotamia. Most scholars believe, just to give us an idea of the distance, most scholars believe that that the wise men actually came from Babylon, which is modern-day Iran, or from Mesopotamia, which is modern-day Iraq. So what this means, to give us an idea today, what this means is they traveled between 1,000 and 2,000 kilometers to get to see Jesus. When you are starstruck, you go to great lengths to draw close. 1,000 to 2,000 kilometers. So what that means is that's like us going from Burlington to Jacksonville, Florida. How many of you would like to be in Jacksonville, Florida right now? How many of you would still go if you had to go by camel? That's what these guys did. I've been on a camel. It's no first class ride, let me tell you that. By camel, over desert and mountains. 
They walk all this way. In fact, the, the nativity scene that we normally look at shows the wise men at the stable when Jesus was there. Most scholars believe that Jesus actually arrived, or the wise men arrived sometime later. They didn't arrive right when he was born. Now, there's a number of reasons why they believe that. One of the reasons is because they traveled so far. It would have taken them months and months and months to get there by foot to travel thousands of kilometers. Could you imagine? And so many believe that they they didn't arrive right at that moment, but they arrived later. Now, some have said, well, if they were wise women, they would have showed up on time, right? In fact, I think if they were wise women who were the Magi, not wise men, they wouldn't even have gone to Jerusalem to figure out they had to go to Bethlehem. They would have had a map before, and they would have gone right to Bethlehem, right? They wouldn't have got lost, right? I mean, if it was wise women instead of wise men, they would have gone right to Bethlehem and not got lost. They would have showed up on time. They would have helped deliver the baby. They would have cleaned the stable and made a casserole. <laughs> but for some reason, God chose to have wise men come, and they showed up a little late. So, so <clears throat> but think about this with me, okay? Kidding aside, think about this. Think about the persistence as they drew closer to Jesus. Day after day, week after week, month after month, pursuing Jesus. Going through deserts and mountains and facing all the reality and the cost and the hardship, just pursuing to see Jesus. See, when you are starstruck with Jesus, you will go to great lengths to draw close to him. Let me ask you a question. What lengths have you gone to recently to draw close to Jesus? What have you done recently to draw closer to Jesus? What have you done to get closer to him today than you were yesterday? Closer this week than you were last week? Closer this month than you were last week? See, when you're starstruck with Jesus and you recognize who he really is, you will do things that you wouldn't normally do. You will do things that other people wouldn't normally do just to get a little closer to Jesus. The wise men did that. They persistently, passionately pursued Jesus. I love the Christmas season. I do. I love it so much. I love so many things about it. I love the activity. I love the fun. I love the gifts. I love the excitement. I love the lights. I love it all. I really do. But ironically, so often what happens is the things that we're involved in actually rob us from pursuing the one who should be the center star of it all. What are you going to do differently this year? What are you going to do differently this Christmas to make sure that you're pursuing Jesus at the center of everything? So the wise men, they did. They showed up. They entered into the house. This is another reason why people think it was later. They entered into the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and they worshipped him. When you are starstruck with Jesus, you will worship him. You will worship him. And when I say worship him and you become a worshiper, that doesn't necessarily mean you become the person that's on the stage in the spotlights leading other people to worship, but you have the heart and the attitude like the wise men show here. I mean, these were important guys, and we're going to talk about more next week. Come back next week. You're going to learn some things about who these guys were that will really be interesting. But yet these guys, as important as they were and as far as they traveled, when they get there, they see this little child and they bow before him. When you're starstruck with Jesus, you don't seek the spotlight. You seek to serve right. Isn't it striking that Jesus, King of all kings, Lord of all lords, creator of the universe 
heaven itself, everything. He didn't come to get recognition. He came to serve. That's what Matthew tells us later in his book. He says, as he's quoting Jesus, Jesus referring to himself, calling himself the Son of Man, he says, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to serve. This is such a striking thought to me. It's so striking in the midst of the world that we live in especially. Because we are so about ourselves. We're so about gaining recognition and getting noticed and getting liked or likes. I mean, people notice our pictures or our, you know, everything about us. It's all about look at me, look at me, look at me. I think the postmodern trinity is me, myself, and I. And it's just about thinking about me and doing something for me and caring for me. And here's the scary thing, folks. If we actually really are honest with ourselves, even when we serve someone else, it's really about us. That often when we go to serve someone, we are actually thinking about how they're gonna think about us or how they're gonna feel about us or what they're gonna say about us, right? I mean, think about it even in the context of buying Christmas gifts for people, right? How many of you, when you buy a Christmas gift for someone, you not only think about what they like, but you think about what they're going to think of you when they get it, right? We think about, oh, I wonder how much they're going to spend on me, so i got to spend this much. And I wonder if they're going to think that I'm generous if I give them this, or I wonder if they're going to think that what, what it's going to say to them if I get this. And How many of you would recognize That even when you give a gift to someone, it it sometimes is just about you. That You've thought about yourself. How many of you would be bold enough to actually raise your hand and say, yeah, I've done that. I've done that. The rest of you are probably lying. (laughs) Right? We don't want to admit that. We're like, no, I just give it because I just love people. Yeah, you love yourself. We all do. See, I got a suggestion. What if we did something different this year? What if we were so starstruck with Jesus that we we did something we didn't normally do? I call it anonymous generosity. This is when you become nobody when you give to somebody. And you can still do your gift exchanges with your kids or your friends or whatever, and that's all cool. But what if we did something else? We did something different. What if we gave to people without letting them know that we were the ones who did it? That we gave to people without them being able to recognize us, without being able to point to us and say, look what so-and-so did for me, or look what such-and-such gave to me. That we actually just gave them. And maybe you don't even know who they are. Maybe it's a stranger you saw who put something back on the shelf because they couldn't afford it. And you just buy it and you find a way to Leave it on the hood of their car when they come out of the store. What if you just did something that that nobody, because I wonder if this could happen, that if we gave to people in a way that instead of thanking you, they thanked God. Instead of praising you, they praised God. So I'd like us to try this. And so what I've done is I thought, well, to make sure that people praise God is we could write a little sentence or a statement like this on whatever it is you give them. The God who created the stars created you even more amazing than them. I think you're amazing too. Merry Christmas. Or something like that. Write your own note to get them to think about God. What if we all did this? What if we did this? In fact, we want to make it easy for you. So if you want to get something to somebody and you don't know how to do it and stay anonymous, then you can bring it to us and you can tell us their information and we'll get it to them, okay? We'll find a way to get it to them and we'll help facilitate. We'll be kind of like the, the Christmas middleman or whatever, you know? So the, we're, gonna, we're gonna find a way to help facilitate this. I wanna encourage you to think about a creative way to do it yourself because really that's part of the fun part of it. But But if you need us to help you, we'd love to do that. What if we did this? We didn't do it to try to get credit for ourselves, but we did it so that people would turn to God and thank him and praise him. Because friends, I gotta tell you, the race to be a leader and to be recognized is crowded. 
but there's lots of room to be a servant. Patrick Lencioni said this, people don't really want to change the world. They just want to be known as the person who changed the world. People don't really want to do what it takes to change the world. They just want to be known as the person who changed the world. They just want to be recognized as doing something significant. But Jesus said, among you, it will be different. Among you, your lives will not be about recognition. But whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. It's not about the spotlight. It's about serving right. This is when we learn that this is what Jesus did himself. He came to serve. He's called us to do the same. And serving, we learn, is not about preference. It's not about serving someone just because they served you. It's not about doing something for someone just because they've done something for you. It's not about helping someone just because you like them. It's not about convenience. It's not about when you have the time or when you have the money. It's serving is the attitude of the heart of who Jesus is. And if we're really starstruck with Jesus, we're just going to serve because it's the right thing to do. This becomes really tough when people act or have acted, responded negatively towards you. This is when it becomes really hard. But what if you did something different this year? What if you served someone who hasn't served you What if you cared for someone who hasn't cared for you? In fact, what if you were so starstruck with Jesus that you served and cared for someone that hasn't done anything for you? In fact, the only thing they've done has been to you and they've hurt you. What if you and I were so starstruck with Jesus that we we did what he did? that came to serve people who had sinned against him? What if we found a way to have the love and the grace of Jesus so fill our hearts and our lives that we showed his love and his grace to people who don't deserve it because that's what he did for you and me? I think, I think, that's what it means to follow the true bright and morning star this Christmas. This is the point of the sermon where normally what I do is I have you bow your heads and, and close your eyes and we, we take a moment to reflect. And, but I, I feel like we need to do something a little different in keeping with the sermon. And I, I purposely have, have ended quite early today to give us space and time. Like I said, I love the Christmas season, I do, but it is so full of activity It is so crazy. How many of you feel like Christmas is, you love it, but it's crazy. It's busy. There's so many things. I mean, we all feel that way, right? So here's what we're going to do. Before we even get into the Christmas season, right now here, we're going to press the pause button. And before we leave, we've got lots of time. Before we leave, we're just going to press the pause button. And here's what I want us to do. I would encourage you to pull out something you can write with, a a pen and paper, a, a phone, an iPad, something you can write with. And we're going to take the next five or ten minutes. I don't want you to just draw close to Jesus and spend some time right now asking him what he wants you to do differently this Christmas season. You know, it might be something pretty significant that he calls you to do. I want you to write it down. I want you to really wrestle with Jesus right now What lengths are you going to go to to draw close to him this year? Maybe God will put in your mind and your heart people to serve, people to be anonymously generous to. We're just going to spend the next five, ten minutes, and then after we're done that, I'm going to gather us together, and we'll sing, and we'll dismiss. But but, but don't don't think about where you got to go right now. Don't think about all the things you got to do. Make Jesus the center star of your life right now, okay? And just spend some time drawing close to him.
just continue to encourage you to pursue Jesus. Even more than just the few minutes we've done today for sure, but may this be, may this be the beginning of what pushes us into a pursuit of Jesus this Christmas season like, like we've never known in our lives. We just draw so close to him. We feel his strength, his encouragement, the boldness and the power of the Spirit lead us to do things and say things that we wouldn't normally do, to lead people to the incredible joy and abundant life of being in a relationship with Jesus. Maybe for you, that's a new journey yourself. Maybe, maybe you've come to a new place in that today. I want to encourage you. I'm going to pray for you in a minute. I want to encourage you that if you want to put your faith and trust in Jesus, you can do that right now. You can do that throughout this day. The Bible says the moment that we do that, we're cleansed, we're made new, set on a new path to follow him. I know that a number of you are believing for friends and family to come to that point of decision as well. And I want you to know something as you continue to pursue Jesus and go to great lengths to do that. Be a powerful example that will draw other people as well. We're going to focus on that next week. You don't want to miss next week. We're going to focus on some pretty important reality of that in our lives. Let me just pray with us. Lord Jesus, thank you for speaking to our hearts and the things that you've said and challenged us with today. And so Lord, we, we uh, are ready to follow you, to serve you, to speak for you, to give and to pursue you in a new, deep way. Lord, I pray for those who just began their journey with you today. Thank you that your word says that all of heaven rejoices when one of us sinners comes to repent and put faith in you. So we celebrate with heaven and that's happened today. And those of us who are recommitting are saying, man, there's been other things that have become more prominent, other pursuits that we've had that have taken the place of our pursuit of you. And so Lord, as we've made these commitments today, seal them in our hearts by your spirit, I pray. I'm excited to hear all the testimonies of what you're gonna do in our lives and the lives of people around us as we pursue you with great passion. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I wonder if you do something with me just as we close, would you stand please? And I wanna sing this song that's become a bit of an anthem around here. We haven't sang it for a few weeks, but it's about Christ being the cornerstone. He's what we rest on, he's who we rest on, he's our everything, he's our strength, our hope, our lives, amen? Would you sing this song with me with all of your heart to Jesus? My hope is filled on nothing less than Jesus' blood and His righteousness.